talking about, I'm talking about not trying to be upset uh, because something didn't go your way. Uh, I'm talking about having enough oomph to stand. Uh, and after you've done all the stand, uh, you're still standing. Uh, Paul said, older women, uh, I need you now. Uh, I need you more than ever. Uh, and not just the older women, uh, but I need the older men. Uh, I need you to be sober. Uh, I need you to teach the young men. Uh, I need you not to be a playboy. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on and put your hands for Jesus just one more time. Hallelujah. Truly we come to praise and magnify the name of our Lord. Truly we're glad to be here, glad to lift up the name of the Lord. Just ask that you worship and praise God with us on this evening.
This morning, I preached uh, Sound Doctrine. Sound Doctrine. That was, that was actually the title. That was actually the title, Sound Doctrine. And so tonight, I'm going to have a title called More Sound Doctrine. Tell your neighbor, more sound doctrine. <laughs> yes, all right. So we're going to go back to Titus, Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I'll try not to go back over everything I went over today, so if you missed it, you get the tape. But I really like the part about being aged, didn't you? Yeah, that's something to be proud of. Not something to deny and despise and reject because you're better than good now. Amen? You're better than good. You don't play games no more. Got time? You ain't got time for foolishness and games. Amen. But Paul told Titus, Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. He said that the aged men be sober. We touched on just a little bit of what it meant to be sober. He said be grave. Having a serious and dignified quality or demeanor. That's what it means to be grave. And since this is part two, um, you don't necessarily, I'm not going to, I'm just going to go through the scripture, all right? But if you want me to read it, I'll say, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Amen. All right, so you may be seated. All right, so to be grave means having a serious and dignified quality or demeanor. And this is part two, so you have to get part one if you want to hear the first part of it. It has to do, and then he says, be temperate, be mild, be that means gentle, not extreme, but calm and reasonable. He says, sound in faith. That has to do with being consistent about what you believe and consistent in right practices. You know, some people are fair weather saints or they camouflage saints. They just do what they do wherever they, whatever they do when they get there. But he says, be sound in faith. Be consistent about what you believe. Be consistent about doing the things that are right. When you reach a certain age, you should reach a place of maturity and soundness where you don't have to play games, you don't have to put on airs, you're just who you are. And it means having the ability to show good judgment, having good sense, being solid, sure of your salvation. Don't allow yourself to be poured into the mold of the present thinking, of the present value systems and the conduct of this world. And one of the things that I love about Indiana is you are a church state and you practice because of the type of leadership you have of being separated from the world. The church has never had more power than when we were separate from the world. We have, in so many cases, lost our value system, lost our dress codes, lost our practices of holiness and loving not the world. And it is unfortunate because even though we've gotten some of the things we wanted, we lost what we had. But the kind of spirit that you feel in this church, you don't feel everywhere. People have traded in the anointing for entertainment. And we don't even have sense enough now or discernment enough to know the anointing from entertainment. Everything that makes noise is not anointing. Just because people are shouting and jumping and dancing does not mean they're dancing under the power of God. And 
So when we, we look at how we've lost so much in order to gain what everybody else has, and, we, and, 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 and what we hear now in the church world is uh, it don't take all that, and, and, uh, and, uh, and we're free. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're free. We're free from healings. We're free from deliverances. Come on, we're free from breakthroughs. We're free from living right. We got what we wanted, but we lost what we had. But when you come into a meeting like this, when people are genuine and on fire for God and uh, obedient and under leadership, that's when the power of God moves. And so Paul says to be sound in the faith don't conform to the conduct of this world, but instead be transformed. Stay solid in what you believe so you have the confidence to teach others the truth. That's what it means in being sound in the faith. And he goes on and he says, and also in charity. Now, again, we're going back because we talked this morning about how he's dealing with the aged men and women. And that's a good thing. So he says, uh, so, so we need to be uh, sound in love. Don't let people, circumstances, challenges, mean people make you bitter and mean like them. Don't let folk who are mean make you mean. Don't let people who treat you nasty make you treat them nasty. Because you're not responsible for how people treat you. You're responsible for how you respond to how they treat you. And I was uh, in prayer the other day, and God just had me crying out to him saying, you're good. And as I began to think about that, he began to put thoughts in my heart about what, it, what does it mean to be good. The Bible says he's a good God. He causes his rain to fall on the unjust as well as the just. He causes the sun to shine on the unrighteous as well as the righteous. And so if we're going to be like God and we're going to practice being good, we got to love people who don't love us. We got to be kind to people who are not kind to us. Come on, we got to be patient with people who are not patient with us. So he says to the age men, he says, you got to be sound in faith and in charity. No matter what you have or what you accomplish, you're nothing if you don't have love. You're just making noise if you don't love people. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us about love being kind, love not being envious. Love doesn't have to show off. Love is not conceited. Love's not full of itself. Love doesn't have to have its own way. It does not behave in a way that's unseemly. It's not selfish. Doesn't get mad easily. Doesn't get easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoices not in iniquity. It doesn't rejoice in somebody else's downfall, but it rejoices in truth. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things, and love never fails. Now, this is something that we have to learn how to study, and we spend time in the presence of God, and we practice so that we can be more like God. We are not like that automatically in our flesh and in our nature. We have to learn how to be like God. We got to be transformed into his image. And this is why what Paul is saying to Titus is so valuable. He's saying, listen, you people who have had experience, you who have reached a level of maturity, you who have come to a place of ripeness, you who are ready to be gleaned and to be picked and to be reaped, you who have learned some things, now your responsibility is through your behavior, your conduct, and your words to teach the generation that's coming after you. So he's assuming that you, first of all, have learned these things yourself. You can't be 65 years old and still being so childish that you cannot take anything. You got to be able to take something from somebody. I had a woman say to me one time after her fourth divorce, I ain't taking nothing off nobody. I said, we can see that. <laughs> you can't be in a relationship and not take nothing you gonna take something cause somebody gotta take something from you so he's saying he says now and then he goes on and he's saying to the age man he says also you gotta be sound in patience you got to have the capacity to accept or tolerate delay. You got to be able to tolerate trouble or suffering without getting angry or upset. Because he understood that sometimes as we age, we get a little cranky. We get a little impatient. 
And so he's reminding us, come on now, folk are watching you. And they're trying to see the God who is in you. And we have to be reminded of these things. We got to be reminded because, listen, all sin is not you leaving the church smoking crap. All sin is not us going out committing adultery. What Paul is saying to us is that we're supposed to be growing and developing because as the outward man is perishing, as I said this morning, your gray hairs, your, 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 your thinning hairs, uh, uh, your knee replacements and arthritis, Arthur acting up and rheumatoid on the block and all that kind of stuff, he says, but, but your inward man is supposed to be developing day by day, being renewed day by day. And it is very important for us as the people of God to understand that we have to be renewed. That's why I can't understand how people can go all day long without calling on God, without getting in the word. Because in order, see, God never intended for you to bear all of the problems and the stresses of life. There are people who are losing their mind. They're having heart attacks. Their hearts are failing them for fear because of the pressures of everything that they're reading and on the, on the, seeing on the news and reading in the newspaper, all the stuff that's happening in politics. But as the saints of God, we got a hiding place. We got a rock that we can go to in times of trouble. Lord, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So every day, I got to make it to the presence of God, and I got to pray and seek his face till I get a breakthrough. I got to go before him and cry out to him because that's how I unload daily. I got to be able to unload. I'm not equipped. I'm not designed to carry the weight of the world on my shoulder. And so I got to be able to talk to somebody who better than God. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. You got to take it to him in the morning and take it to him in the afternoon and take it to him in the evening hour and take it to him when the sun goes down. We got to lay it on him because the Bible says casting all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. I don't, I don't even try and see, and see what I do. I got, I go, I got my, my little prayer room and I, I got to go in there and, and I got to just cry out to God. And, and even when I go, you know, you don't go into his presence and talk about how great you are and all the things you accomplished. And that's why prayer is boring to you because it's all about you. Uh, uh-uh. you, you ain't getting nothing like that, but you got to go broken. You got to go saying, God, I'm one here go your needy child again. You know who I am. Uh, you got to go and, and let him know that you're depending on him. I trust you for this. Oh, if you leave me to myself, I'm going to shipwreck. If you leave me to myself, I'm going to mess up. If you leave me to myself, I'm going to embarrass you, God. Uh, but oh, if you help me, I'm going to make it this time. Oh, God, I'm trusting you to bring me out. I'm trusting you for my marriage. I'm trusting you for my children. I'm trusting you for my finances. I'm trusting you for the situation that happened on yesterday. I got to unload on you, God, because I can't bear this alone. The reason why we're so weak and falling away is because we have not discovered the power of prayer. We don't even know that the secret of prayer is to go empty, emptying yourself in his presence and calling on his name. And he says, goes on to say, and I'm going to say as I begin to teach this tonight, what I say to the wives is meant for the husbands, and what I say to the husbands is meant for the wives. But he says that the mature women, the aged women also, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Mm. Notice, notice what he says. He says, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. Mm. 
He's given the description for what every church should be doing in women's ministry. We have women's meetings and we just have conferences and events, but there's no passing the baton. There's no training up the next generation in many places. There's no teaching them about what they're supposed to be doing as young women when we have our conferences. But he gives us a clear statement and purpose. The older women are to teach and train the young women how to live as saved, sanctified women. And as I said this morning, it doesn't necessarily have to be from behind a podium or in a classroom setting, because you can, you can, you can uh, learn how to cook from an old woman, but it may not be a cookbook she got. You just got to get in the kitchen with her. <laughs> you got to get in there, because I, when, I, when I first got married, I was on the phone with my husband's grandmother, and I was trying to get this recipe, and I said, well, how much of this do you put in it? She said, I don't know, girl. Just put it in there until it tastes right. <laughs> she, she was trying to teach me how to make some cornbread dressing over the phone. And she said, you get a little sari and put it in there. I said, who? She said, some sari. I said, who? Sari. I said, sari? Who? What's sari? She said, sari. I said, you mean celery? She said, that's what I said, sari. So why doesn't the teaching happen? Because different generations have different understandings of ministry. Young women may expect a formal mentoring and teaching, while older women may not feel equipped for this, but if you get in the kitchen with them, you're going to learn something. You're going to learn something. Second reason why it doesn't happen is because we have a tendency to resent unsolicited advice. I've never seen a generation of folk that don't want to hear what's right. Everybody got their own answers. Everybody, you try to tell them, don't, don't do this, don't wear that, don't go here, don't do this. Why? Ain't not, why, why? <sighs> and they want to attribute it to you being old time. No, it ain't old time. I'm trying to teach you some common sense. <laughs> and we have a tendency to only seek counsel from the so-called experts or close friends. But see, it was the experts that got us in the trouble we in today. Did you know that it was the Dr. Spock generation that went against the Bible, told you not to whoop your kids, but to, be, uh, to find out, well, there got to be a reason for the things they do. And messed up a whole generation. And now folk are going back saying, you know what? The Bible was right anyhow. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. Come on. The next reason why this teaching is not happening is because feminism makes us uncomfortable with teaching on biblical womanhood and makes us embarrassed to pass on womanly skills like how to keep a household. Today, they don't even want to know how to make a bed. They ain't scutting about trying to learn how to cook because they'll just drive through a fast food restaurant. All those hormones and injections and all that stuff in the chicken. Come on. Ain't never heard of a crock pot, a slow cooker. But God was saying to us, uh, let me sh and, the la and the next reason I want to say women in Western culture live isolated lives because they got to get up and go to workplaces. They don't have time to visit each other's homes and help train one another. But in this society, the women had time to train one another and train the next generation. The extended family was very, very important. Growing up around your, grand your kids, growing up around their grandmas, their aunts, their uncles. But when people started going to college and getting out and the society became industrial instead the agricultural, they begin to spread further and further and further apart from the family, and so there's no connection like it used to be. And so Paul, he gives the qualifications. 
He says to the older women, he says, here are your qualifications. You cannot be false accusers. In other words, you cannot be slanderers or devils because Satan is the false accuser. And, he's, and, he's, and what he's saying to them, you cannot intentionally be liars. You cannot unjustly criticize the hurt and condemn or sever a relationship. If you're going to be a teacher of good things to the next generation, you cannot be a backbiter. Come on. You cannot be an accuser. You cannot make charges that bring down and destroy because if they see you gossiping about everybody in the church they will not trust you you won't be able to say anything to them because they already heard you talking about sue over there so if you're going to win this generation you got to win their confidence you got to win their trust he says you got to be trustworthy that is what holiness is all about because sometimes we want to talk about the young folk who are not doing right, who are smoking and tipping out and, and drinking and, and snorting and all of that kind of stuff. But we can't be sinners either in the house of God. We can't be lying and gossiping and false accusing, come on, and criticizing. We got to be as women that become holiness. Holiness make you sweet. Holiness make you honest. Holiness cause you to have integrity. Holiness teach you how to shut your mouth. Holiness teach you how to embrace those who need to be embraced. Spank those who need to be spanked. Turn around and love them and affirm them. You can whip them on one hand and love them on another. That's what holiness women is all about. And, and Paul says, teach them. Show them explain to them how to do something, educate, instruct them, coach them, train them, guide them, instruct them, and demonstrate. Teaching is the process of attending to people's needs. Don't be an old woman sitting back snickering because somebody don't have on the proper clothes and you can't buy them none. Don't, don't, don't get in a corner Talking about somebody's skirt too short unless you're willing to get a few pennies together and buy them a skirt. And don't go ask the church for the money to do it and quit worrying the pastor about it. You do it. Somebody, can I, can I just teach tonight? Can I be real tonight? You got young women and young men coming in the church. They have never had any Christian home training. They don't know the things that we know. You got people that are coming in the church in this generation, coming out of the world, they, 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 the things that they have been involved in. Listen, they are looking to you for guidance. Listen, if you're around some young person and they got body odor, don't sit up there and, and turn, put your finger under your nose and talk about them. Go buy some soap. Come on. Right. Go, go, go get them some laundry detergent. And don't tell every, and don't present it to them in front of everybody else. Okay, can I? Come on. Woo! Uh-uh. You go in your pocket. And if you don't have no money, you go get the mother next to you. And y'all say, we're going to get some money together. We're going to buy so-and-so some new shoes. Come on, we're going to buy her a skirt. We're going to get some stockings for her. Come on. And we're going to get some toiletries together. And we're going to present them to her in private. And, just, and we're going to make no big deal out of it. Just give them to her and say, use this baby. Hmm. Teaching is... The process of explaining, encouraging, training. And so what Paul was saying to the age women, he says, hold the young wives. He's talk now he begins talking about them in particular. He says, hold them to a standard that is unfamiliar to them, yet is vital. Y'all, If y'all stay with me, I'm going to preach in here tonight. I already feel it. I'm preaching right now. <laughs> Hold them to a standard that's unfamiliar to them 
and yet vital for the success of their marriages and families. And I said to you this morning, I will repeat this part. They were saved in a pagan society where the marriages were prearranged. Wasn't no love in it. Did they? I, I'm getting out of here because I don't love him no more. They ain't had no love to begin with, but they had to learn how to love him. Now that we got to feel everything. Feel, feel, I feel, you, didn't, you, you didn't feel love when you got into marriage. You felt lust. Now that the lust is gone, you want to go. Uh-uh, baby, but you made a vow. You made a vow. You made a vow. You made a vow. One of the strongest forces for spiritual ministry in the local church lies with the older believers. You have reached a point of ripeness and maturity where God is depending on you because without you, the generation behind you will die. That's why you can't be 65 trying to act 21. Come on. That's why, that's why you can't be 70-something years old trying to wear the clothes of an 18-year-old. Because, baby, you might think it's working, but it ain't working for you no more. <laughs> no more. <laughs> Ooh, I know I'm helping somebody. But see, when you, when you get to a point of maturity and you know who you are, you ain't got to compete with somebody who half your age because you got it going on all by yourself. Baby, why are you trying to figure it out? I done worked it. Woo! Oh, God, can I get a witness in here? You might be dropping it like it's hot, but I done shook it and it baked already. Come on. Little girl, go sit down. Where I am, you trying to get there. <laughs> Glory to God. He said, so Paul, Paul was saying, they got to be held to a standard that they are not familiar with. Because they are coming up in a pagan society. Now, I tell you, I, I won't go into all this, but I, but I went back and I was studying the Roman society. I mean, uh, extra biblical, outside of the Bible. I'm, I started studying that society, and I mean, it really blew my mind. How, how, how love was nowhere in the picture. They didn't even marry for love. They weren't even marrying for love. Uh, they, they, they got love and sex someplace else. Marriage was a business deal. See? And, and, and see, but see, when Christianity came into play, Christianity revolutionized the world. Because now the Apostle Paul says to the married folk, husbands, love your wives. You can't trip around. You can't go outside. On, oh, God, help me today. You cannot cheat. You cannot commit fornication. You got to learn how to not just be with the one you think you love, but love the one you with. That's powerful. Oh, God. Yeah, stay with me just a little bit. I'm coming down your street. Huh? Glory to God. And so, and so Paul is saying, he says, he says, they're not familiar with how to love their husband. They were, women were treated as slaves. They were just pieces of property. They just did things out of duty and responsibility. There was no feeling in it. It was a, an arrangement between the two families. It was a contractual agreement that they got together. And so, and so now Paul comes in. He says, Titus, because the women who have been in church before the ones who are coming in got there, they understand better than the ones who are coming in. They live with their husbands. Uh, they learn how to love them. And what does that mean? How does it translate? Because we jump in shout in church and speak in tongues and praise God but unfortunately it does not translate to when we go home and so and so he was saying to them he says listen these young women were saved out of a pagan culture and they had to get accustomed to a whole new set of priorities and privileges and listen this 
This training process requires that the older women be committed to being responsible, confrontative, and affirming. In other words, not only do I have to check you on stuff in a loving way, but I got to turn around and praise you when you do the right thing. See, foolishness is bound up in the heart of children, but it's the rod of correction that drives it far from them. These women, you didn't have to hit them physically, but you had to correct stuff out of them through teaching and example that you set before them because they did not know how they were supposed to love these men. And now that they are in Christianity, you mean to tell me I got to love this man that bought me as a slave? How do you do that? And in this generation, women... Because of the society that we live in, they're coming out of the world, coming into the church, and many of them have had no examples around them. Their grandmothers at the age of 35. They didn't have a mom at home to train them. So they come into the church, into the Christian society, and Paul says it is very crucial it is crucial if we're going to save that generation, if we're going to teach them about holiness, that you be on point age women, that you learn what you need to learn because they're coming in here and they're watching you. So you got to teach them how to love their husbands. How do you love your husband? How do you love somebody you have no feeling for? And the reason why some of you don't have, don't have the love for your husbands that you should have is because of the way you disrespect and treat them. Because you cannot have good feelings for somebody that you don't like. And you cannot have emotional, warm feelings for somebody that you mistreat. And then by the same token, when you learn how to respect him, okay. When you learn how to give him honor, even when you don't feel it, you begin to do it because it's right to do, the feeling will follow. See, see, we, see, 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 we wait on a feeling, but God is waiting on the behavior. You provide the behavior, he'll provide the feeling. Oh, God, I'm, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> we ain't ready for this. Glory to God. So, so it was a big challenge for them because Emotional love, psychological needs, and even sexual uh, uh, needs in the Roman world, they, 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 were, they, were, they were actually satisfied outside of marriage. I'm not, that, that wasn't right. So they, when they came into church, they had to learn a whole new way of thinking. And when the men got saved, the immorality in most cases stopped, but it did not make them or their wives intimately close or sharing as friends. Because what we got to understand in the church is that love Loving, caring, romantic wives are trained, not born. They're not, they're not born. They didn't come here knowing how to be a wife. And those with unsaved husbands, I, I really want to deal with this today. Those with unsaved husbands need special encouragement. You trying to be saved, trying to come to church and he won't support you, and the same thing if you got an unsaved wife, you looking around at all, uh, you, you, you women who have unsaved husbands, you looking around at all these brothers dressed in suits, shoes all shined, praising the Lord. They're sitting with their wife and kids, and the devil will cause you to be discouraged because you got to go home and hear somebody cussing and carrying on and acting like a fool. Is that real or what? Come on. Or maybe he's not acting like a fool. Maybe he's a hardworking man. He's just not saved. Maybe he loves you, but he's just not saved. Maybe, or maybe he is saved and he's just not, he's not faithful to church. Even if he isn't saved, you ought to learn how to treat him like a man of God at home until he becomes one. Oh man, this, this, this some hard stuff I'm preaching here. 
this some hard, but this the kind of preaching I came up under. This is this is what you call sound doctrine. That's why I said more sound doctrine. So 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 you can't you can't you can't mistreat them. You can't fail to cook for them. Come on, you can't you can't you can't reject him him intimately. Okay okay. All right, I, I, I'm trying to help us. I'm trying to help because I'm talking about more sound doctrine today. All right. So he said, so look, you can't you can't cuss him out. You can't neglect your duties as a wife. You can't hold back your affections. That is not the will of God. That is not even how God operates. He lets his rain fall on those who are unsaved, spitting at them, cursing them, not treating them right. He lets his rain fall on them and his sunshine on them. And the Bible says, uh, let your good works shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven a person cannot argue all by himself you have to show respect even when they are not acting respectably towards you you cannot retaliate you cannot threaten that's what Bible, the Bible says in first Peter chapter 3 when it talks about Jesus and how he was reviled but he reviled not again how he was threatened but he didn't threaten back and it says you wives likewise in the same way that Jesus was he says be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they may also without the word be won by the conversation or the behavior of their wives. You ain't going to win them trying to poison them. Then Peter, Peter goes on and talks about it. He says, even your beauty. Uh, yeah, you, 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 you looking like a million dollars stepping out of the house, but you're, but you're mean as a junkyard dog. Uh, not here, but let me just keep on here. <laughs> Your beauty should not come from the outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles, wearing of gold and apparel, but it should be the inner beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, he didn't say you had to be mousy and you had to be quiet. That may not be your personality. He's talking about don't always be ready for a fight. Don't always have your dukes up. He coming in here now. He better not start. <laughs> mm-hmm. I got something for you to hear today. Come on. <laughs> he said, he say, well, honey, did you see my... No, I ain't seen your shoe. I don't wear them. You wear them. <laughs> okay, honey. <laughs> he in there. He done worked 12 hour shift. He in there looking in the refrigerator trying to see if there's anything to eat. He bet not ask because you, you done been off since three sitting home on the, on the telephone all day long. Come on. This is the kind of stuff he's talking about. Teach them. Show them. Show them how to be considerate. Show them how to be respectful. Show them how to be mature. Show them how to be considerate. And most of it is simply consideration. Treating people how you want to be treated. That goes for both sides of the fence. It never ceases to amaze me how we can be so respectful to everybody else but disrespectful to our own mates. And you're supposed, you supposed to honor the pastor, but as soon as he's talking, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Husband call you. You don't even answer the phone. Yeah. He said, listen, and, and you understand he's using Sarah as an example in that text, but he's, Sarah wasn't no pushover. She told, when she told Abraham, she said, get this bond woman and her son out this house. God said, you better obey her. <laughs> So she wasn't no pushover. See, and that's where submission is so powerful at. It doesn't mean you're a dish rag. It doesn't mean you're a doormat. Submission is power under control. Oh, it's power under control. Because if you're being forced to submit, that's not submission. That's coercion. Submission is, I know who I am, but I'm a woman of integrity and power and honor, and so I know how to take the lower seat when it's time for me to do it. I know how to abase and abound. <laughs> ah, I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan, and never ever let you forget you a man.
let me check Bishop, Bishop Stern's temperature. <laughs> he said, so he says, listen, likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Giving honor unto the wife is unto the weaker vessel. Weaker means more precious. She's like your, she is your fine china. Now, you might throw a paper plate in the trash, but you don't throw your china around. The Bible says that you are heirs together of the grace of life. And if you don't treat her like an heir, God said, I won't even hear your prayers. I want you to get this. I want you to get this because this is sound doctrine. This is sound doctrine. There's not another woman on the face of the earth that you are in heir with, but the one you are in covenant with. I don't care how many pounds she's gained. I don't care how much hair she's lost. I don't care how sick she is. That's your covenant partner for life. You are in covenant relationship with your wife. And if you don't realize that and value it properly, God won't hear your prayers. Stay with me. Malachi 2 and 11 says Judah hath dealt treacherously. Treason means betrayal. It is an abomination that had been committed in Israel and in Judah and in Jerusalem. It says, for Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The reason God did not want Israeli men marrying women from other religions is because, number one, they would lead their hearts astray. Number two, they would beget children who would be confused and mixed up and not serve the true God. And there goes another generation of apostates. And God says, if you do that, I'm going to cut you off. But not only that, in verse 13, he says, and another thing you do. He says, you flood the altar. You weep and wail uh, because God no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accept them from you. And then you got the audacity to ask why. Look at what the answer is. Look at this. This blows my mind. He says, because he is witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. You have dealt treacherously with her. The word treacherously suggests actions that are inconsistent with the covenant vow before God. What applies to one applies to the other, husbands or wives. To God, marriage is not just a civil arrangement that you can treat any way you please. Civil law changes with the times and from society to society, but marriage is a three-way covenant between the husband, the wife, and God. It is a higher contract. Proverbs 2, 10 through 17 says, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion will preserve you. Understanding shall keep you, to deliver you from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of unrighteousness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked. But watch this now. He goes on down the next verse. He says, and it keeps you from the, from the stranger which flatters with her words. Wisdom will save you from the enticements of men who follow ungodliness and from the seductive words of the adulteress. Whenever you see in the scriptures the strange woman or the foreigner is anyone other than the man's own wife. Marriage vows are spoken when you stand at that altar. That's the reason why people, you're not supposed to go into it un unadvisedly. And that's the reason why when you go to a man of God and you say, I want to get married, and he tells you to wait, you need to wait. That's the reason why you don't be headstrong, because the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Because other folk can see stuff you can't see. That's the reason why if everybody in your family think the joker ain't no good, you better drop the joker. 
And quit this lie talking about, I ain't marrying your family. Yes, you are. I ain't marrying your family. I'm marrying you. Your mama don't like him. Your daddy don't like him. The preacher told you not to marry him. Your cousins don't like him. Your uncle don't like him. Your niece don't like him. Don't nobody like him but you, baby. You better put a hold on it. Because everything ain't coming up daisies. <laughs> the marriage arrangement is a covenant between the husband, the wife, and God. No marriage is perfect because it's a union of two imperfect people. That's why you need Christ in your marriage. There's a whole lot of saved people who come to the same church, but Christ ain't in the marriage. There's a whole lot of people who say they're Christians, but ain't no Christianity going on in the home. Because when you save, you're going to seek God in your household. You're going to put the word of God on top of everything you do. You're going to seek wise counsel before you make permanent decisions and anything that you do in your household. And you need God in the marriage. <laughs> They don't seek the Lord, they don't pray, they don't ask God's help. And when the marriage experiences trouble, one or both of them think that they don't have to earnestly work on the healing of the problems that caused the disruption in the first place. So what do they do as soon as problems start? They first of all, they start withholding marital intimacy from the other as a form of punishment. When sex becomes a weapon, you degrade it to an animalistic level. And rather than earnestly working to resolve their problems based on the scriptures, they start seeking ungodly advice from everybody else around them and turn into ungodly sources. I told a lady, she was in her 40s, I said, she, she just was hard-headed, wouldn't listen. So much she leaving her husband, she walking out. I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to say this, you ain't going to listen, I know, but I'm going to tell you anyhow. I said, when you leave him, you won't remain single. I said, you won't. I said, you gonna, either you're going to be married or you're going to be single. And when you're single, you're not supposed to be having sex. I said, when you get out of that marriage, because of your age, your flesh and your hormones are going to get to working on you. And you're going to find yourself with somebody in an illegal situation, in an ungodly situation. So why don't you stay with him and try to work out the problem? Try to work with it. Because the Bible tells us that that's what we're supposed to do. And Paul said that you're not supposed to defraud one another except it be by consent. I I'm going to move on, okay, for a season that you may give yourself. Wait a minute, got to be with consent. So you being on a fast every other month, that ain't with consent. You on a fast, a 40-day fast again, so you can't be intimate with your mate because you fasting again. You just did a 40-day fast last month. Now... Okay, I, 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 this, this sound doctrine, I'm just, I'm just teaching, all right? And, and, and you got folks so mixed up over this, they, they are, and they ain't even trying to get spiritual, they just on a fast. <laughs> just on another fast. So, I'm, I'm trying to keep this G rated. So he come in and you all button up from head to toe in a potato sack. No, you can't get through the feet way. Can't get through. No way. And, and, and you on a fast again. But the Bible, the Bible doesn't even teach that. The Bible says, accept it be for a time with consent. Come on. That you may give yourselves to fasting and praying. Come on now. And then come together again unless Satan tempt you for your lack of self-control. So there has to be some communication and some consent going on and some agreement with what you do. Okay, y'all don't like that. But, but, but we missed the part where it says it has to be mutually agreeable for spiritual reasons. 
And so, we, and so Paul, here he is, he deals in this chapter. He's talking to the older people and he's saying to them, you got to be in a position to show these things, to demonstrate these things, to teach these things, uh, because I need there to be a change uh, when the folk go home. Uh, it ain't just about them shouting and speaking in tongues in church. It ain't even about a revival or a crusade. That's all right. But but the, but the more revival you go to, the sweeter it ought to make you. The closer you get to God, the more loving you ought to be at home. The more you fast and pray, the more you ought to be willing to submit and agree and be in cooperation with one another. You ought to be a team working together in your household, not tearing one another apart. Paul said, teach them that. Run, tell that. Run, tell that. Testifying about everything else. Come on. Testify about how God humbled you to go back and say I'm sorry to your mate. <laughs> Look what he said. He said that they may teach the young women to be sober, to think right. They just crazy. Yeah, but you've got to teach them how to think right. To love their husbands. What I just gave you was examples of how to love him. How to show respect, how to be kind. Come on. How to be thoughtful, how to be considerate, how to be good. And that goes both ways, all right? How to, how to, how to be respectful to one another. Not always at each other's throats. Look at what he says. He says, uh, and how to love their children. And that's a whole nother subject. How to be discreet, how to be chaste. Because the women in that society, they, 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 they were doing it too. They were not faithful to the marriage. They were drunkards because they was trying to escape the effects of the slavery. They, were, they, they would go outside of the marriage to, 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 to have affairs and all of that kind of stuff. And Paul is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is what you did before you came to Christ. But now that you're in Christ, there's supposed to be a change in your life. And if you let me, God said, I will help you to love him. I will help you to love her. I will help you to be faithful to one another. I will help you to glorify God in your household. He said, and teach them how to be managers at home. Teach them how to be keepers at home. Teach them how to be good. Teach them how to be obedient to their own husbands. Why? That the word of God be not blasphemed. Because this is a different walk. This is a different society. This is a different place that you're in, in the church of the living God. And in this place, we teach you manners. In this place, we teach you integrity. In this place, we teach you holiness. In this place, we teach you how to get along. In this place, we teach you obedience. In this place, we teach you how to serve the Lord with gladness. In this place, it's not like any other place. This ain't the VFW Hall. Uh, this ain't Red Lobster. Uh, this ain't the YMCA. Uh, this ain't Burger King. Uh, hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us have it our way. Uh, no, this ain't the Golden Arches. Uh, this is the house of the living God who Why? Why must it affect how we live? That the word of God be not blasphemed. That people will not look at you going to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. They won't look at you in your white missionary outfit on. They won't see you marching to church with your tambourine in your hand and your Bible under your other arm. And they were watching you. But they can't see you when you get inside this building. 
but they see you on 6th Street and 7th Street and Polk Street uh, and they see how your children are being raised and they see how you're treating one another and they see how you're loving one another and Paul said the bottom line is, uh, is that this thing got to work even outside the church uh, oh, it's got to work in the house uh, it's got to work in the marriage uh, because God has given you power uh, and what you got to understand is that the Holy Ghost came to give you power uh, not just to lift your hands and shout uh, not just to make your feet move swift uh, oh, but this power God gave uh, it works when you're upset uh, it works when you're angry uh, the Bible said be angry but sin not uh, you can be as angry as a rattlesnake uh, but when you got the Holy Ghost uh, before you let those bad words come out of your mouth uh, the Holy Ghost will check you uh, and say you're going too far you said too much uh, shut it down shut your mouth uh, don't say another word uh, he wanted them to understand uh, oh ladies uh, you ain't finished uh, you ain't washed up uh, you ain't being kicked to the curb uh, we need you now uh, more than ever uh, we need you to stand up and be counted uh, we need you to be an example uh, we need you to teach uh, like you never taught before uh, we need you to show them uh, cause they coming out of the world uh, and the world is polluted uh, the world is all messed up uh, the world is crazy uh, but I need some teachers uh, I need some holy women who know how they're supposed to adorn themselves. I need some holy women to set an example. I need some holy women who have lived with their husbands and learned how to take some stuff. I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about being beat up. I'm not talking about staying in a situation where you're unsafe and your life is at stake. But I'm talking about not divorcing because the toilet paper ran out. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about not trying to be upset because something didn't go your way. I'm talking about having enough oomph to stand. And after you've done all the stand, you're still standing. Paul said, older women, I need you now. I need you more than ever. And not just the older women, but I need the older men. I need you to be sober. I need you to teach the young men. I need you not to be a playboy. Oh, we don't need uh, no Pentecostal playboys, uh, but I need some older men uh, who are self-controlled, uh, who ain't involved in pornography uh, and a pornographic age. Uh, oh, uh, can I get a witness in here? Uh, somebody ought to help me because I'm getting ready to get out of here. Uh, say yeah. Uh, come on, lift your hands uh, and begin to bless God. Uh, Paul said, I need uh, some stable old men. Uh, I don't need you wearing a suit uh, and living like the devil when you get home. Uh, I don't need you dressed up in a tie uh, on Sunday uh, and then committing all kind of ungodliness uh, the rest of the week. Uh, what I need uh, is some older men uh, and some older women uh, who got power. to put the devil to flight power to show them how to shut their mouth power to show the young men how they're supposed to work and earn a living and they ain't supposed to be trying to hook up with no sugar mama leave the cougars alone glory glory Hallelujah. But you need to work with your hands. You need to work and earn your own money. And women, no matter, you might have a degree and make more money than him. But you still got to recognize him as the head. You still cannot be disrespectful. You're a team. You're working together. You are heirs together with God. That the word of God be not blasphemed. So people won't look at our God and say there ain't nothing to him. Ain't nothing to that. They jump and shout, but I live next door to him. Oh, oh God. How many of you really want change? I, come on. Let me, 
let me begin to end by saying I didn't, I didn't always know this myself. I didn't always know what I know now. I had to learn. And there was older women in the church who set an example before me. They taught me by what I saw them do. And while you're feeling displaced and rejected and kicked to the curb, somebody's watching you. Come on, come on, church. Oh, God, somebody else ought to praise them right there. You ought to praise them right there. Come on. If you've been saved five years, you ought to be five years further along than the person who just got saved on yesterday. Come on, church. You ought to be able to teach somebody. You ought to be able to show somebody. You ought to be able to be an example of respect to the pastor. But if they see and hear you being disrespectful under your breath to the man of God, you're teaching them how to disrespect him too. You got to show them how, by how you obey, by how you obedient in the house of God. Why? That the word of God be not blasphemed. When God began to teach me this, I know I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with growing older because I'm getting better now. I'm more seasoned. I'm ripe. I'm more ready. I'm not unfinished anymore. I have reached a place, and so have you, of maturity where you ought to be able to be sound in doctrine, sound in faith, sound in love, sound in patience. Come on. You ought to have been already tried in the things that somebody else getting ready to be tried in. Uh, and I'm speaking these things to you today because if I speak them, somebody go grab it. Somebody go grow up. Somebody gonna be delivered. Somebody gonna be transformed. Somebody gonna be changed. How many of us want to be better? I mean, I mean, you really, really want to be better. You want to, you want to be in your mind and in your spirit that seasoned saint that mature person in God. No, Paul said, when I was a child, I did childish things. But now that I've become a man, I put away childish things. Now that you are grown up, now that you are an adult, now that you are better, come on. Uh, you got to get rid of the things. Uh, uh, boys play with toys, but you're not a boy no more. You're a man. Come on. You're a woman now. Uh, and I don't know about you, uh, but I'm so glad for this, this text. Uh, I'm so glad to know uh, that God is still using me. Uh, and even if I'm not behind a pulpit or sitting behind a desk with a microphone, uh, he's using me every day. He's using me in my household uh, to train my grandchildren. He's using me in the church uh, to help the younger women. Uh, nobody has to know my name. Uh, I don't need my name in lights. Uh, I don't need to be called to preach anywhere. Uh, oh, but I got a desk uh, in my living room. Uh, I got a desk uh, in the church in the ladies' restroom. Uh, when I'm in there with the women of God, uh, I can begin to impart some things unto them. Uh, the world itself uh, is my pony. I got a podium everywhere because I'm teaching good things by the grace of God. Yeah. This stuff about you bored and you idle and don't nobody want. Stop that. Stop that. Because you should always be teaching. Well, they never call on me to preach. Stop that. Everybody's not a pulpit preacher. Everybody's not a convention speaker. Come on, stop that. Start teaching your own children and grandchildren. Come on, start teaching. Find folk in your family to teach. Start teaching your neighbors. Start being an example of the holiness and righteousness of God. God wants to use every one of us. You're not too young and you're not too old. Do you hear me? You're not too old old. You're not finished yet. God still has need of you. The generation coming behind you has need of you. Lift your hands right now. Mm.
God, we serve a generation that wants novelty, phenomenon, newness, something unfamiliar, exciting. But there's so much in the naked word of God that we have not mastered. And we are here today because we heard your word. And we want to be all you're calling us to be. We've had generations that gave the next one the wrong hunger. We've taught them how to be preachers and missionaries. We've taught them how to be evangelists. But we haven't taught them how to love their husbands, to love their wives, to love their children, to be chaste, to be keepers at home, to be discreet. And we have failed you in that. Let every one of us go home and set our homes in order. Set our children in order. Apologize where we've messed up. And pray for strength as a family to get it right. Give us the grace to be transparent in our families. That they would know that we're human and we make mistakes too. And that is why we need you in every area of our lives. Thank you for your word. Thank you for sound doctrine. It's not about us going across countries and cities winning souls if we're losing the ones we're with every day. It's not about us just teaching Sunday school and our own children don't attend. Let us reach back and get those who belong to us and teach them first. Because we want to be right. We want to be saved. We want to be whole. God, we need you to help us that the word of God be not blasphemed. I want, as you stand in the presence of God, just search your heart. Ask the Spirit of the Lord to search me. Let this word find me. Because your goal is that I be transformed into the image of your dear son. Not the image of Hollywood, not the image of the world, not the image of those I see on television, not the ungodly shows, no. Not materialism, not careerism, but your goal is that I be transformed into the image of Jesus. Help me, Lord. Why don't we just take a moment and just because some of you, it's in your belly, and it got one. Let, just let it come out of your mouth. Just begin to ask the Lord, Lord, help me. I want to be better. I want to be better, Lord, than I am. I want my family life to transform my neighborhood. I want to bless the next generation that's coming behind me. I want to be an example to the children that are following me. I want to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And I want to show them the right way. Yes. 
Oh, God. Is there anybody who will say, help me, Lord? I want to be right. I want to be saved. For real. For real. Come on. For real. I want you to get a hunger in your heart for just a moment. I want you to let that get down in your sanctified soul. I want you to begin to say, God, I want to be saved for real. For real. I don't want just the appearance. I don't want just the outward show. But I want you to check me in every area of my life. I want you to get in my business. I want you to get in my stew. I want you to get down in my heart. I want you to go home with me. I want you to know where I live. I want you to hear my phone conversation. I want you to be able to hear every text I send. Help me, God. Oh, I need you to help me. I don't just want to sing in the choir. I want my husband, my wife to know that I am really saved because they live with me. Oh, God. Oh, God. I want to learn how to be a good person. I want, to, I want to learn how to love people when they're not responding to me. I want to learn how to do good to folk who don't like me. Instead of me getting mad and getting angry because people don't respond the way I think they should respond. I want to learn how to love them like you love them, God. I want to learn how to love them like you love me. Oh, God. God, help me, help me, help me. Because in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. My flesh got an attitude. My flesh is nasty. My flesh is filthy. My flesh is ungodly. But the spirit of a holy God lives in me. And you said you will lead me and guide me into all paths of truth and righteousness. So when you speak to me, don't let my stubbornness get in the way. Let me do what you say, when you say it, how you say it. God. Let me follow you. Not just to the church building, but to repentance. Let me follow you to kindness. Let me follow you to gentleness. Let me follow you to love street. Use me. Use me, God. Not just to preach, not just to teach, not just to break down scripture. But use me to forgive. Use me to love. Use me to heal. Use me to help somebody get delivered from their stuff. Use me. Oh, God, when I they cannot have an attitude, use me, God. Use me. Oh, God. Uh, somebody just say, use me, Lord. Use me, God. Use me. If you open yourself up to the Lord right now, there's going to be a change that comes over you right now. Because you can't come into the real presence of God and not be changed. You cannot get in God's presence and really let him have his way and remain the same. You will will not go home the way you came if you really, really worship him and let him in right now. This is the moment of truth. Don't play. Don't pretend. You got to let him in. You got to let him in. You got to let him in. Every one of us got areas we got to work on. Come on. You got to let him in. I dare you to let him in. I dare you to let him deal with you. I dare you to let this word soak down in your spirit. I dare you. I dare you to open up your heart and allow God to have his way in you right now. I dare you. That's where change occurs. Ah!
I'm almost done. But I am, I am living the best years of my life. Better than all the years I've lived in my youth. Because of this scripture right here. I have more joy than I've ever had. Because I've learned that all the things that I did wrong in my youth, my impatience, my intolerance, instead of allowing it to haunt me, I've learned from that experience to be better. Isn't that awesome? And now I can stand here today and tell somebody else that Jesus can change you, that he does live. Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Oh, God. I just feel the Spirit of the Lord in such a way. I just want you to just, just show some brotherly love, sisters to sisters, brothers to brothers. Just get somebody and hug him and say, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better. Come on, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better. Come on. Come on. Tell him, tell him. That's right, that's right. Come on, show some love. If you hurt somebody, tell them I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you for being patient with me. I didn't know any better. When I, when I learn better, I'll do better. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better. Thank you for your patience with me. Thank you for enduring me. Thank you for putting up with me. Husbands ought to tell their wives, I, I didn't know how to love you, but I'm learning. <laughs> wives ought to go tell your husband, I didn't know, I didn't know, honey, I didn't know. But if you pray for me, I'm going to do better. 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 I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better than I was because of the word of God. I want to be right. When you say if you want to be right, all you need is a word. All you need is revelation. All you need is understanding. I didn't mean to hurt you. I just didn't know. I didn't mean to neglect you. I just didn't know better. I just didn't know. Nobody taught me. I wasn't there. But now that I know, I'm going to be better. Oh, somebody ought to praise him. Somebody ought to just let that praise out. Come on. We got to give him all the glory. We got to give him all the glory. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Isn't it exciting, y'all? The house you know, we're going to we're getting better. We're getting better. We're learning. We're growing. We're developing. We're not stuck like Chuck. We are actually learning. We don't have to stay young because the older we get, the more we're going to learn, the more we're going to develop. Our outward man may be perishing, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. Come on and give them a praise. Oh, oh. 
Any of the still waters. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's the water call. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you have not repented of your sins and have not been baptized in Jesus' name, now is your time. Come. Thank you, Jesus. The spirit of repentance is here. Here is water. Go down in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins. And the Lord Jesus Christ will wash all your past sins away. Now is the time. If you feel the spirit of the Lord tugging at your heart, tugging at your mind, based on the powerful message, more sound doctrine, now is the time. Now is the time. Show God that you mean business going down in his water in Jesus name for the remission of your sins and the Lord himself will give you the Holy Ghost God will give you the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues as the spirit of God get the utterance now is your time now is the time now is the time is there one is there one? You're not too old, and you're most definitely not too young. Where are you? Is there one? If there's no one at this time, may God bless you in Jesus' name. We give you all the